Just start by imagining that you're out on the streets of whatever town or city you may live in with a clipboard and a survey form. And the two questions that you're asking the people that you are surveying are these. Where did we come from and why are we here on planet Earth? I would suspect that the majority of the responses you would get to those two questions are first of all, well we evolved from non-living matter and to the second question, I don't know why we're here, it's all by chance. You might hear a minority view, such as was expressed by Brother Stephen in his prayer. All life forms were created by God, and we are part of God's plan for the earth. But there is now a third view, which, which tries to sit in between those two positions. It's called theistic evolution, or evolutionary creationism. And it's believed by the Pope. Let me quote you some words of Pope Francis, spoken on the 28th of October, 2014. When we read about creation in Genesis, he said, we run the risk of imagining God was a magician, with a magic wand, able to do everything. But that is not so. Evolution in nature is not inconsistent with the notion of creation, because evolution requires the creation of beings that evolve. That's the Pope's view. So, which is right? Well, we could spend all night arguing about scientific discoveries and conclusions, but what we're going to do tonight is look at the Bible record and ask the question, which view of Genesis does the rest of the Bible support? And the reason we're going to do that is that I believe that the Bible is the word of the Creator. It's always been proved right. It's internally consistent despite being written over 4,000 years. It's constantly verified by archaeological discoveries. Bible prophecy predicted events which we can see happening around us in the world. So we're going to look about, at passages about the creation, about man, and about the origin of sin and death. So let's begin where the Bible begins in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 describes the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything that was in them in six days. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And Genesis 1 verse 1 is followed by a clear narration of six days work in which all things were created. So does the rest of the Bible take this as a literal account or is it interpreted in some other way? Let's move on to the book of Exodus and chapter 20. And here we have the Ten Commandments. So this isn't just any ordinary piece of Bible text. These are the words of God himself spoken through his angel from the Mount Sinai to the people of Israel who were assembled before the Mount. Exodus 20 and verse 9. Six days shalt thou labour and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. And there is a reason given. Verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. And this is taking Genesis 1 absolutely literally. Not suggesting any allegory or that it was a series of visions or, or any other non-literal approach. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is. Let's move forward into the New Testament now to letter of the Hebrews and chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and the quotation that we're going to look at takes us straight back to the beginning of the reading that we took from Genesis chapter 2. So Hebrews chapter 4 verse 3 For we which have believed do enter into rest. So the context is Israel going through the wilderness journey and heading for the promised land where they might find rest. And not getting there because of unbelief. So verse 3, For we which have believed do enter into, his re into rest, as he said, As I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. 
Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So that's telling us it was a complete and finished creation. It wasn't a work of development. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And so the clear teaching there is that that God performed all his work in the six days prior to his rest on the seventh. Turn back with me now to the book of the Acts of the Apostles and chapter 4. So far I found ten passages in the New Testament which talk about the whole work of creation. And we're just going to look at three of them. So Acts chapter 4, Peter and John have been taken by the Jewish authorities who were grieved that they were preaching the resurrection and threatened. So Acts Acts 4 verse 23, And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David hath said, and they go on to quote Psalm 2. So they address God as the maker of the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Now we move on to Acts 14, where the Apostle Paul and Barnabas are preaching in the city of Lystra. They've healed a lame man and the local priest of Jupiter wants to offer sacrifice to them. And Paul and Barnabas protest. Acts 14 and verse 15. Or 14. When the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. So there again we've got a testimony to the fact that God made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. But more than that, that in his creation God is an interventionist God. He gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons. Now we know there is a hydrological cycle. The water evaporates from the sea and from lakes and goes up and forms clouds and then the rain falls and the runoff goes into the rivers and the rivers into the sea and the lakes and so forth. We know that that exists. But I could show you 20 passages in the Bible and I don't claim that's an exhaustive list that God is involved with this and he can cause it to rain on one city and not on another to teach his people lessons. That he brought a flood of waters that he brought droughts and rainstorms at appointed times all these things are not just quote natural they are under his control God is involved with his creation let's go to the last book of the Bible now the book of Revelation and chapter 10 and in the book of Revelation chapter 10 we have the vision of the angel who is called the rainbowed angel because we're told in verse 1 that a rainbow was upon his head and so we call him the rainbowed angel And in Revelation 10 verse 5, John records that the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. So here is an angel swearing by God God who created the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them and all of these passages and say that, that's three out of a list of ten that I have testify that God was involved in all of these things 
Turn back now to the first letter to the Corinthians and chapter 15. See, there are those who argue that yes, God was involved, but he set a process in motion and, and things sort of developed and evolved from there. But that's not how the scripture describes the creation. Genesis 1 says that God made the herb of the field after his kind and the trees bearing fruit after their kind and the beast of the earth after his kind and the cattle after their kind and the creeping thing after their kind. Each individual kind of creature or plant was individually created by God. And that's the teaching in 1 Corinthians 15. So verse 37. That which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or some other grain. So the sower goes out to sow and he's got a basket of grain. It's just those little grains of corn and he puts them into the ground and what comes out is a plant which eventually bears seed. Verse 38 But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh but there is one kind of flesh of men another flesh of beasts another of fishes another of birds. And also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. The glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. But one star differs from another in glory. So all these different kinds that God has made, individually and distinctly, separate from the others. And it is one of the great problems of evolution, that these various kinds cannot interbreed with one another. And if they do manage to interbreed, then the offspring is sterile. So, the rest of scripture, and we've only been able to look at a very small sample, does take Genesis 1 literally. It doesn't teach a process of evolution. So let's look now particularly at the creation of man. Back to Genesis chapter 1. Atheistic evolution, those evolutionists who don't believe that there is a God, um, propound that man has come from other living creatures. They talk about common descent. I would rather talk about common design. If you give a child a big bag of Lego and say, build me ten models, and the child does, and the models are all different. But when you look at them carefully, the same designs of bricks appear in them all because that child has taken the basic building blocks and, and, and built the models and God's creation on a far grander scale is a bit like that so Genesis 1 and verse 24 and God said let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind and it was so and God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man, not after his kind at all, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Man is distinct from all other creatures. Because he and he alone is made in the image of God. And he has promised dominion. So chapter 2 verse 18. The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. There was nothing else in all the creation that God had made that Adam could have a relationship with. Because he was distinct. 
He was different from all the other creation because he was made in the image of God. And did you notice as we read through Genesis chapter 2 that the man and the woman were created separately and by different processes. So Genesis 2 verse 17, verse 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. That's the Hebrew word yatsar and it's used of the potter. When the potter shapes a vessel on his wheel, he forms it. That's the word. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So that's the creation of the man. Now what about the woman? Verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, margin, Hebrew, Builded he a woman and brought her unto the man. So the man was formed out of the dust of the ground. With the woman, God had a starting point, a building block, if you like. That which he had taken from Adam. And upon that and around that, he built the woman and brought her to the man. Now, what does the New Testament have to say about all that? Turn with me to the Gospel record of Matthew, chapter 19. And when you found the Gospel record of Matthew chapter 19, just put your left hand there, and with your right hand turn to the Gospel record of Mark and chapter 10. <clears throat> because these are two parallel records of the same conversation which Jesus had with the Pharisees. So Matthew 19 and Mark 10. Matthew 19 verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto Jesus, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Mark chapter 10 and verse 6. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Remember how the Bible starts? In the beginning, God created. What Jesus is doing here is making three quotations from the book of Genesis. I'm back in Matthew chapter 19. He which made them at the beginning. That's Genesis 1 verse 1. Made them male and female is Genesis 1 verse 27, which we've just read. And verse 5, And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, is a quotation from Genesis 2 verse 24. And Jesus not only takes those texts literally, he bases his moral teaching on marriage, on first of all what God did when he made them in the beginning male and female and then upon what God said about that situation that a man should leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they twain should be one flesh. So Jesus is taking Genesis 1 and 2 very literally, very literally indeed. Now turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2 where well, the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy about the respective roles of the man and the woman in the Ecclesia. Absolutely fascinating subject that we haven't got time to go back and look at. But very, very clearly in verses 8 to 10, he shows that the man and the woman have roles in the Ecclesia equally vital equally holy, equally profitable, but very different. Why so? Verse 12 of 1 Timothy, verse 11 of 1 Timothy 2. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For 
Adam was first formed, then Eve. And that's precisely what Genesis chapter 2 tells us. Adam formed of the dust of the ground, and then Eve was built. Verse 14, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, was in the transgression. And that's exactly what Genesis chapter 3 says, as we will see in a minute. It is the woman who said to God, The serpent beguiled me, and I, and I did eat. Adam didn't say that. Because he wasn't beguiled. He wasn't deceived. And again, the Apostle Paul is using those words in Genesis to base his moral teaching on the role of the man and the woman in the Ecclesia. So what's the validity of the moral lessons if those specific acts of creation didn't happen? And isn't it significant that in our society, a rise in egalitarianism, which means that people view men and women as totally equal in all things, either able to do anything that the other can do, no differences between them, that a rise in egalitarianism has coincided with a, a rise in the belief in evolution which draws no distinction between the man and the woman. But if you turn back to the first letter to the Corinthians again, and this time chapter 11, the Apostle Paul, who commanded those who read his letters to understand that the things that he wrote were the commandments of God, that's 1 Corinthians 14.37. So in 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul wrote this, verse 3, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So there's a hierarchy. God, Christ, man, woman. Where does that come from? It's based on God's creative acts, not on an evolutionary process. Verse 8. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. And that's what we saw in Genesis chapter 2. The Lord God took one of Adam's ribs, and around it and from it he builded a woman. She was of the man. Verse 9. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Adam couldn't find and help meet for him in all of God's creation. So God said he would make and help meet for Adam. And he did. She was created for him. But this concept of the woman being formed out of the man doesn't fit any scheme of evolution. But this concept and the moral principles that arise from it are consistently taught in the Bible. Have you noticed that throughout the pages of the Bible, the only ancestor of the human race who is spoken of is Adam? So he's there in, in Genesis chapters 1, 2 and 3. First Chronicles chapter 1, which starts the, the chronology of the human race, begins Adam, Seth, Enos. And if we turn to Luke chapter 3, we have there the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ through his mother Mary and her descent from David's son Nathan, Solomon's brother, and then going back through Jacob and Isaac and Abraham and Noah, down to verse 38 of Luke chapter 3. Which was the son of Enos? Which was the son of Seth? Which was the son of Adam? Which was the son of God? And that's it. We are right back to the beginning. There's no mention of any other race or any other creatures that could have had a relationship with them. Because Genesis 2 has told us very clearly there was nothing in all of creation that could be in help meet for Adam. Back to Genesis again. It is crystal clear that all creatures were formed by God. We've seen this already in the 
verses in chapter 1 that we've read. Now look at chapter 2 and verse 5. Genesis 2 verse 5. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And then at that point, the Lord God formed man. And similarly as we have seen in verses 19 and 20, all the creatures were brought to Adam. And he named them. But there was not one that was an help meet for him. And then chapter 3 and verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. All humans descended from her. And she was formed by God. She was built, built by God. So the whole teaching of scripture is that Adam and Eve are distinct and separate from all the rest of creation. They're in the image of God and they were created in different ways. So let's move on now to Genesis chapter 3, the next section of this book. And we move on now to issues of which evolution knows nothing. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 says three things about the serpent. First of all, he was more subtle than any other beast. If you search through the book of Proverbs, you'll find that the Hebrew word, which is translated subtle here in Genesis 3 verse 1, occurs eight times in the book of Proverbs, and every time it's translated as prudent. And the prudent man is commended. So there's nothing evil or wicked about this serpent. He has a degree of wisdom. And Jesus said to his disciples, Be ye wise as serpents, harmless as doves. That's the first thing. He's subtle. Secondly, he's more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So the serpent is classed with the beasts of the field that we read about in Genesis chapter 1 and verses 24 and 25. He's made after his kind on the sixth day. And that's the third thing that Genesis 3 verse 1 tells us about the serpent. He was made by the Lord God. So he comes under the umbrella statement in Genesis 1 and verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So the church's idea, and I've read this in church books, that at some point the devil entered the garden and took possession of a serpent and used him, Although that's not explicitly stated in the Bible, you know, it must be true, because they believe in the devil. But that's not what scripture says. The serpent is a beast of the field, he's subtle, he's got the level of wisdom, which is greater than any other beast of the field, and he's made by God. Now, this creature is unknown to modern man. Look at Genesis 3 and verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So the snakes that we see in the world today are not like the serpent who was in the Garden of Eden. They don't have the qualities that Genesis 3 verse 1 tells us about. There's no creature like him around now that, that science can look at and do any experiments with. But if you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, look how the New Testament regards these events that are described in Genesis chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. And here's the Apostle Paul's exposition of the matter. 
2 Corinthians 11 verse 2 For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. You hear echoes there of, of Genesis chapter 2 where God has builded the woman and brought her to the man. Verse 3 But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, or another spirit, or another gospel, there's the problem. But you see how that concern of the Apostle for the spiritual safety of the Ecclesia is based on the literality of the Genesis narrative. Just as the serpent beguiled Eve, I'm worried that these false teachers who are coming in among you are going to lead you astray. So a warning is given based on the situation that happened in Eden. Take away, spiritualise, read Genesis 3 in some non-literal way and all the force of that evaporates. Now turn back to Romans chapter 5. This is the chapter and particularly the verse that knocks the bottom out of the theistic evolution ship. And the key verse is Romans chapter 5 verse 12. Romans 5.12 Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So, the first thing that we need to notice in, in the words of one brother is that man is older than sin. There was a time when man was in the world and there was no sin described in Genesis 1 verse 31 as God saw everything he had made and behold it was very good and Romans 5 verse 12 is telling us that the consequence of sin was death and that's exactly what Genesis chapter 2 says keep a finger in Romans and just turn back to Genesis chapter 2 we've read what Eve said to the serpent about what God had said but let's now actually read the words that God said to Adam Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15 and the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it and the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Very clear, very explicit. You eat of the fruit of that tree, you will die. But what if Adam didn't eat of the fruit of the tree? What, what if Adam was completely obedient to that commandment of God and eschewed the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Should he die? Where is the justice of God in that? The whole teaching of scripture is that obedience leads to life and disobedience leads to death. Keep that finger in Romans and turn past it to Revelation chapter 22. Because we have a picture in this very last chapter of the Bible which is the absolute antithesis of that which we've just read in Genesis chapters 2 and 3. And as I said earlier there is one author of all of this book who knew the end from the beginning and caused Genesis 2 and 3 to be written in the way that they are, that Revelation 22 might be written the way that it is. So Revelation 22 and verse 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. You see the contrast. In Genesis chapter 3, you've got a man who did not do God's commandment and is excluded from the garden that he may not eat of the tree of life. He can't go through the gate because the cherubim are there with a flaming sword to stop him. But now in Revelation 22, we have individuals who have been obedient and because of their obedience, they are given the right of access to the tree of life. There is no barrier at the gate they may go freely in and out of the city. So, yes, it's the antithesis of Genesis 2 and 3. 
but it's totally based upon it, as the rest of the Bible is. So back to Romans 5. Read verse 12. Whereas by one man sin entered into the world, and the context makes it very clear that one man was Adam. Verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that have not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him who is to come. So the man who sinned is clearly Adam. But Romans 5 talks about another man. Verse 15. But not as the offence, so also is the free gift. Through, for if through the offence of one, Adam, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Verse 18. Therefore as by the offence of one, Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, Jesus Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. All are subject to death because they are related to Adam. Those who choose to be related to Christ have hope of life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we have the same truths expressed. 1 Corinthians 15 says the same thing, but takes it further. So, verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, and that word in there means related to, we're all descended from Adam, we're related to him, therefore we die. Even so, in Christ, if we're related to Christ, shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. So these two passages, Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15, are telling us that Adam is the root of the problem, and the Lord Jesus Christ is the solution to it. But... Let's just go on a little further in 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 24. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So death was never a part of God's very good world that he created in the beginning. Death is an enemy which is to be destroyed right at the end so that a world will exist. This planet Earth peopled by immortals. People who will not die. People who will live forever. Turn back to Romans again and chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 verse 9 Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more death hath no more dominion over him death isn't something that was part of God's creation it is verse 23 the wages of sin it's the consequence of sin it was earned as a result of sin and the whole teaching of the Bible is that man is alienated from God by sin, by transgression, by rebellion against God's law. And it's worth just asking the question, if man did evolve, at what point did he become responsible to God's laws? Time was when men would say, I believe, because the church taught it, so it must be right. Then came scientific rationalism, you know, the age of, of discovery. Uh, and men would say, I know, because science has proved it to be so. And those parts of the Bible which conflict with current scientific knowledge must therefore be wrong, because the science, scientists have proved it. And there are some who sought to have the best of both worlds, to have some science and some Bible. 
The Bible is not acceptable to those scientists who have rejected God and evolution shouldn't be acceptable to Bible believers because it destroys faith in God's word. You see, if things didn't happen as they are described in Genesis chapter 1, it means that in Genesis chapter 1 God isn't actually telling us the truth. So, if God doesn't tell us the truth in Genesis chapter 1, at what point in the Bible does he start to tell us the truth? We've seen tonight that Jesus, the Son of God, and his apostles believed in the book of Genesis. In those early chapters, literally, they quoted them. They used them as the basis for their moral teaching. They quoted, and they spoke, and they wrote the words of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. If we want to be followers of them in the way of eternal life, then we should believe that creation record also. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings, and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's milestone snippets which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's weekly world watch and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.